we have three uh, panelists today, so I will speak briefly about the macroeconomic context in which people's movements are taking place today. Uh, there will be Siddharth Mitra, a New York-based uh, uh, activist who has visited parts of India, who will be briefly talking about Chhattisgarh. But uh, mainly the discussion today will revolve around uh, the Maoist movement, which has uh, attracted a lot of attention <coughs> over the last few years. And for that, we have uh, the privilege of having with us Gautam Nolakha, uh, prominent human rights activist from India who has studied this uh, movement in great detail. So he will speak to us on that in, in, in its various aspects. So he was one of the few people who visited the uh, Maoist organization in, in parts of Chhattisgarh and Tandakaranya region where a kind of guerrilla zone exists and an alternative power structure and structure of governance is evolving. So he has uh, written a very detailed report of that which has been uploaded on Sanhati. So if you are interested in reading in detail, you can go to Sanhati and read that. So he will speak about all those issues that he has, uh, he has touched on in, in that report. So without further ado, I will uh, make some brief comments on the macroeconomic context and then we will move on to a uh, more detailed discussion on the Maoist movement from Rotam Nolaka. And the last speaker will be Siddharth Mitra. Let me start by talking about uh, the area that I visited and describe to you what I, what I saw, you know, the history of that uh, struggle. And then I'll come to other questions and probably in the course of our uh, in, in interaction, many other things should be taken up the history, the larger issue of left movement in India, where one places Maoist movement in that, etc., etc. The various questions, the differences between the various movements, what are the, uh, the, the you know the lines of uh, 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 difference, etc. Um, One of the areas which is described as the strongholds of the Maoist and where they also claim to run a parallel administration of some sort, um, uh, some kind of a nascent state in making, uh, which that is how they, 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 are, they explain it, uh, is, uh, happens to be in central India in Chhattisgarh state. Uh, it's an area of Bastar, uh, some parts of Orissa, Maharashtra, and uh, some of the areas in Andhra Pradesh. And this they call the Dandakaranya uh, uh, zone, uh, which cuts there for, I mean, it, it encompasses areas which, which are part of about five states of central India. Uh, they've been working there since 1980. It's now that they have been noticed and that we'll come to that later, uh, why it became imperative for the government of India to think in and see that as a challenge uh, in, uh, in, in, after, in, in, in 21st century and not uh, in the earlier phase. Uh, they've been working there since 1980, where the party cadres uh, moved in around 78, 79, towards the end of 1970s to this area. Um, the reason why they moved was because uh, the People's War Group, which was active in Andhra Pradesh, in areas which bordered uh, Chhattisgarh, uh, the state, uh, um, uh, the state in central India, um, um, because uh, around 70, 77, 78, the large mass movement. I mean, they had been working with the Adivasis and other and the peasant communities in. Uh, several districts of Andhra Pradesh where mass movements had emerged and had become actually an extremely uh, potent force. Uh, the repression started from the state side 
the party decided that they, they it would it would uh, it asked its cadres to to uh, to, to you know uh, move out from those areas in order to preserve uh, the, uh, the, the their forces. That's how they entered this new area. And since 1980, they began uh, working in in in, in Bastar. Now, this is a remarkable story. In fact, and as far as I'm concerned, it's a heroic story. Because this was an area, I mean, when they came in, this was an area which has not had any experience of any left movement or even the presence of state in any form, even during the British Raj. They entered this area, so they were not even just not confronted by, I mean, they, it was not, they, they faced a lot of threats. I mean, from, from, from wild animals to, to malaria, to uh, entering a new area where they were not known, where they had to win the confidence of the people. Uh, so the entire history of how they how they won the confidence of the people, how they won the and and established themselves is still remains to be told. I mean, it still remains to be written. But in a nutshell, what it they they they, they entered this area. Uh, this uh, and one of the things which they first did in order to win the affection was they start, I mean, they, they, they ask the villagers um, to, to boil water and drink boiled water and especially give boiled water to children, which brought down infant mortality by nearly 50% in this area and which won them the, the confidence of the villagers that these people mean well, that these are not just outsiders who have come to harm them, to loot them, which is what they, the, the tribals had experienced until then. Uh, both at the hands of outsiders who had entered the area as well as at the hands of the forest officials and the police. <clears throat> this provided them with, with uh, an, an, an entry into this new terrain. They started working and they, uh, they, did, they, they did a survey and they decided that they'll start off by in trying to, they, they took up the case of, they discovered that they, these people were being uh, exploited by by various contractors who used to come to buy the forest produce from the tribals. Um, the rates, for instance, uh, just to give you an example, I mean, when in 1980 they entered this area, they discovered that the price which the tribals were being paid for bamboos which were cut and sold to the paper mills, which used the bamboos to, to make the pulp and prepare the paper, uh, was around 7 paisa. 7 paisa for, for a bundle of 20 bamboo uh, shoots, okay? And this price was set in 1947. This was negotiated by the company in 1947. It had remained more or less unchanged between 1947 to 1980. They decided that this the, 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 the very important, it's very important to try and organize the tribals around the issue of these various forest produce which they sell. Uh, tendu leaf, uh, bamboo, um, tamarind, uh, which is grown in large quantities in the forest and collected as a minor forest produce and, and sold, and which is used in, in daily cooking in large parts of, of, of uh, in almost all Indian homes. Uh, so this, this first began by organizing uh, the tribals and they stood, and they they began by 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 ensuring that no uh, that that the, the these producers were not sold anymore at the price which had been fixed at uh, you know uh, several decades back the uh, with this they further gained confidence and during the whole struggle which they had they the people also discovered that these that these uh, uh, radicals, uh, the, the revolutionaries who had entered this area, they didn't. They weren't just uh, talking. That they, they were in fact uh, at the. Uh, they were right there in front uh, to confront. I mean, during the struggles and agitations and the conflicts which used to take place, they were there, and that they, they saw them laying their lives also, or suffering, or being injured, uh, together with their Adivasi colleagues. This won them further affection of the people and. And that's when they began to think of um, uh, of the next things. Now, and this is where the Maoist movement is very unique in India. Um, around 1990s, they decided that they had they had organized the tribals around uh, what they described as Dandakaranya Adivasi Kisan Majdur Sangatan, which is the Dandakaranya tribal uh, worker peasant uh, organization. Uh, 
uh, which was in it, uh, which was formed. Uh, then we decided that this is time that started taking a look at closely. Uh, until then, they had not touched, they had not uh, disturbed any of the existing tribal system that, uh, 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 that uh, the, the land the, the land ownership patterns which, uh, which had been there, they had not interfered with that until then. They decided that this is time to, to take stock of uh, the reality, the social reality of the Adivasi area. So it's not, and their understanding, the Maoist understanding was that the Adivasis are not an homogeneous community, it's not a monolith, it's a stratified uh, society and they discovered that there were these tribal chiefs and 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 tribal um, um, uh, a section of the population which control large land holdings that there were sections of the, of the poorer adivasis who were working in these on 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 those lands and in fact they they had to first work on the land of the chieftains before they could tend their own fields um, and they also discovered that there were there were a large number of Adivasis who did not have any land, or if they had land, these lands were of extremely poor quality. Uh, this is when they interfered for the first time in the Adivasi society by pushing for land reform. They took away lands of the landlord of the, of the chieftains, distributed.